Uh, it's just about uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. That's 13 hours and 30 minutes into the day of May 23rd. <coughs> Uh, time for another sleep vacation. This will happen more and more in the summer, <laughs> where the body is feeling uh, so that uh, uh, I just want to sleep all day. So not much is sort of scheduled on this, this for today. Very, very mild, very light schedule. Basically, eat, sleep, cartoons, do some reading, and that's about it. Not the amount that I usually do. I usually study while I do watch cartoons, or watch some of the vlogs, but uh, not today. Today is mostly going to be a day of rest and sleep and eat. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't mean the mind stops working, it just means that uh, uh, my physical limitations are such that uh, the amount of doing is significantly reduced. Uh. And it does take a while for the mind to wake up, so the conversation is not necessarily there. Uh, the only thing I can sort of think about now, and it's sort of mulling this over my mind still, is that uh, Lion LeBron is feeling a little bit in the dumps right now. Uh, his last uh, live was talking about how he doesn't fit in in the world. A lot of a lot, a lot of people don't fit in the world, particularly those who consider them on the more intellectual path, because in many cases they need to be the center of the universe. They see themselves as something extraordinary. And here's the thing: if you achieve the extraordinary, right, you're beyond the average. Who do you connect with? Because you're beyond the average. You've achieved what you wanted. You see what others don't see. Mirror. Is that a watch? I mean, that's the nature of your being. It's being intellectual. Is you say, oh, you're going off on a on a on a, tra on a track uh, less traveled. I mean, most people don't go down the intellectual route. It's, it, it's relatively few who do that. And then beyond that, the number of people who actually do uh, go beyond the intellectual to, to, to where I am are even fewer still. So the disconnect is extreme. I mean, this is this is what basically defines a nerd. And the thing is, as a nerd, you have to find a sense of self that you're happy with. And just kind of realize that that's it. Your happiness is, your own, is in your own nerdiness. Uh, others may not, you know, in terms of what you desire, others may not like what you're doing or partake in it. But it's yours and yours alone. <laughs> Depending on what your nerdy intentions are, or the like is. But 
did this, I've seen this before in Lionel, he goes through these phases where if something hasn't worked out the way he expects it to work out, he gets into a, a, into a funk, he gets into a mood. And then there's a shift in direction, but the shift in direction is rather complex because uh, Because they're always, no matter what direction you turn in, there are always going to be complications. Things aren't always going to work your own way. And if you're an exacting person, and many intellectuals are, they're very exact and very precise people. This is kind of what we see in Project uh, uh, Chronicles. We see this uh, in. Uh, Yes, Minister, and yes, Prime Minister. We see the intellectual world and the, the need for perfection, the need for exacting measures and words. And it becomes very frustrating because the world isn't often like that. There is a lot of, in many cases, there's a lot of. Uh, say bending, <laughs> but I don't want to necessarily call it bending because uh, it's kind of like the wind, the wind shifts, and this is what we talk about, the political wind. The political wind isn't anything that is uh, standard, and it has, it, it, it's significantly outside of what we call standard. <laughs> So it's more akin to surfing, so, you know, can an intellectual adopt a surfing type of manner where you're more loosey-goosey rather than uh, exact and precise? Eh, the mirror is a bit of, has a bit of an issue to it, so anyways. <laughs> so that's the only thing I'm th type of thing I'm thinking about. And again, it goes with the you know the Barchester Chronicles and the, uh, a lot of these old, these old uh, stories from the uh, from the 1800s. And every underlying era has uh, uh, a sort of a, a birth in another era. Another era has changed because. Uh, there was something that was going on before that sort of created the movement. And this is where I'm looking into now, looking into the year of Voltaire. Uh, <coughs> and I find out, it, 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 bizarrely enough, this is what I sort of thought, that Voltaire really didn't do much of anything. His entire claim to fame was that he produced <laughs> a document that wasn't approved by the Crown. And, Back then, all your documents, anything that was published and printed, had to be approved by the Crown. Uh, without that seal of approval by the Crown, uh, as, a, as a stamp of authority, uh, your books and whatever you produce were uh, somewhat illegal. Well, actually, they were considered called illicit. They're not so illegal. Uh, and... This is what his whole entire claim to fame is that he did not have this approval of the crowd. He was sort of considered to be anti-establishment for his day. But when you look at the actual content of what he's produced, in other words, you go beyond the myth, begin to realize there's really not much there for you today. Well, there was kind of this, you know, again, 
from the upper societies, from the well-to-do. Didn't have much to do during the day, is there, you know, but decided that he was an intellect and began making fun of everybody. And so he wrote these plays, and that's there's, there's, there's a kind of guy like that in this, the Barchester Chronicles named Bertie. It's just about uh, 8.30 in the evening, so it's about uh, 20 hours and 30 minutes into the 23rd day of April. We're in the Victoria Day long weekend, so people will have more off. My dad and I, particularly my dad and I, we're getting into these discussions. About the various different things that we study, because we're, we're, each, we're, each, we're each, uh, in different areas, we're, we're, but there's an overlap with each researcher. That's right, so of my dad and down the uh... No pop. Cause the camera to turn around. <laughs> as much as you think areas of research, or areas of study, are sort of separate and isolated, uh, we well certainly find enough that is sort of comparable that a good discussion can be had. And this is the case with my dad and myself. Uh, even though he's in theology, because physics goes into metaphysics, and there's certainly a large historical component. My dad and I can have some pretty significant com uh, 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 conversations. And the thing we've been sort of talking about is with the Voltaire the, and the sort of the path that Voltaire sort of left, and this sort of includes Lionel LeBron. Lionel LeBron is of the Voltaire type of intellectual, which is really devolved.
and you can discuss actually within the history of philosophy and where we are currently as the de-evolution of philosophy from a certainty where Marx was, Marx was within the Voltaire, within the Voltaire line, that you can talk about a certainty that ends up disappearing. So you go from a philosophy of, of existentialism, still within an existential philosophy, uh, what comes up in 1945 is a philosophy, an, exi an existential philosophy of non-existence. That nothing exists, that everything is simply a concept, there's no reality. And this is the world where we are now, it's known as the postmodern world. Where there's no reality, everything is simply a concept. And everything is, is in, in the state of deconstruction. And this is what we see now. And the thing is, ironically enough, everything that we see now, the whole set of deconstructed, the, the modernism, the postmodernism, uh, can be seen in Dostoevsky's work. So it's not anything that's new. But you see that with humanism, there's a, there is a, a sense of despair. Because the defined world designed and looked for, uh, and hoped for by the, uh, the, the intellectual collapses. It never stays real. And so what happens, you have the world of the intellectual in an almost continuous state of collapse. And this is something that's very difficult for an intellectual to understand. So the moods of Lionel LeBron very clearly reflect this. And so what happens is that we're simply using Lionel LeBron as an example of what an intellectual is. So it's not just him himself. He's simply an example. And it can, in terms of a litmus test, it's not that he's the highest person. But what happens, he's well placed, he's got a good history. So that, if you want to see how people are behaving in the upper echelons, what they're kind of thinking, what their mood is, you'll look to Lionel LeBron because he can reflect some of the sentiment. So you get a good, you get a half decent read on it. Litmus tests do not tell you any everything. It gives you some information. And the reason why Lionel LeBron ends up in the classification of conspiracy theorist isn't because he doesn't look at stuff carefully. It's he doesn't look at it enough. That he doesn't have enough information to complete his thoughts. And this is the problem with the conspiracy theorist. They don't have enough information. They haven't spent long enough going deep enough into the particular areas of research in order to really sort of put together the right conclusions. So as I said, the conspiracy theorist may have all the right information, may have all the right pieces, but the puzzle is put together wrong. And this is why I go back in history. This is how I ended up with a Voltaire. I didn't go down, end up going down the Voltaire line. I ended up going down uh, the line in terms of the history of mathematics and physics, particularly calculus and physics. I went down the Newton line, bumped into Leibniz, and then once I bumped into Leibniz, went back up into Dostoevsky, and then from Dostoevsky went back down to Voltaire again. Is that this is where you can start seeing things 
divide into different schools. There are different schools of thought. There are the rationalists, there are the humanists, there, there, are, the, there are the scholastics. Uh, there's a number of different schools. There are the, the secularists. There's the humanists. I think I already mentioned the humanists. There's another school like that called the secularists. And they create ideas and thoughts that typically they thought were brand new, but it, 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 it comes in this whole sense of modernism as to the Western uh, ideas that sort of evolved from Voltaire. But all, uh, Voltaire, if you look at him carefully enough, didn't do anything. What Voltaire did was to take work from other researchers, other scientists, like uh, Newton Leibniz, and simply paraphrase their work, making it more well known. That's all he did. He was a paraphraser. He didn't actually create anything of his own. But nonetheless, he was an intellectual. He enjoyed having people listen to him. That was his thing. This is, he was at a time where the, the academic salons were just being developed, and they were developed by women in the parlors as part of their social gathering. 